Welcome everyone. We'll give it a, a couple of minutes so that all of you can join us. We're so excited to be here with everyone. Thank you. Happy Thursday, Kendrick. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Colegas webinar, the first Thursday of every month. And um, we're so excited to present to you today Latinx Brilliance and Resilience. And we'll be focusing on men, student parents, and formerly incarcerated system impacted students. Next slide. We always begin our Colegas webinar series with a land acknowledgement, and I'm so proud to introduce to you one of our Colegas who was just selected as the new Vice President of Student Services at Lake Tahoe Community College. We're so proud of Michelle Batista, and we thank you for participating in our service called La Escalera. Um, Michelle. Thank you, Cynthia. We begin this presentation by acknowledging our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of indigenous peoples throughout the state of California. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relations past, present, and emerging of the lands from where we all gather today. We thank the UCLA American Indian Studies Center for providing this land acknowledgement model, and we encourage everyone joining us to continue to learn about the traditional land caretakers where your college is located and work to be in good relation with them. Next slide. And I wanted to remind everyone that Colegas was created during a time when the national political landscape was portraying our Latinx community as criminals and scapegoating us as people who do not contribute positively to our nation. These sentiments were all too familiar for those of us who grew up as Chicanas, Chicanos, and Chicanx activists. And we are aware of historical exclusion and the ways in which those practices still have a stronghold on our society today. Colegas create space for community college practitioners and our allies and supporters to do everything possible to ensure we eradicate racism and bias in all forms and eliminate equity gaps while preserving our cultura and centering the needs of our students. And I'm so proud to introduce to you Dr. Angelica Garcia, the president of Berkeley City College and, and the first Latina president of Berkeley City College. We're so proud of you. Angelica. Oh, thanks, hermana. Um, good afternoon, colegas. We're so happy that you are able to join us. Um, as my hermana here, Cynthia, just shared um, very much at the start of colegas, we acknowledge that we had a very strong um, Chicano, Chicana, Chicanequis perspective. But please make no mistake that we are a broad organization to support our um, very incredibly diverse from all parts of Latino and South America. And um, so please know that this space is for all of us. Us. Um, 
Now, I am absolutely honored that I get the opportunity to welcome our next colega and hermano. Uh, Dr. Paul Hernandez um, is joining us from the East Coast, um, so it's actually pretty much evening for him at this time. Uh, Dr. Hernandez earned his doctorate in sociology, where he specialized in education, social inequality, and diversity. Um, he is a nationally recognized speaker. He's been involved with um, informing uh, leadership for college access and success, community out outreach, and um, pedagogy for educators. And one of the things that I hope you're going to see you're in for a real treat is what it means to take theory into practice, especially to support students. Inspiration. I was taking copious notes, and I feel like I'm really, as a you know, sitting president right now, I, I really felt uplifted by your by your presentation. So thank you, sir. Um, I'm also really equally excited to share and introduce one of my favorite researchers and scholars. I've had the opportunity to get to know Dr. Adrian Huerta very well over the last few years and become a big admirer of his work and the impact he's making on students and especially around the research in community colleges. And so let me talk a little bit about Dr. Huerta um, before we invite him to the, to the Zoom stage. Um, Adrian Huerta is a tenure track faculty member in the Puglia Center for Higher Education located in the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. He uses qualitative methods and asset-based theories to study boys of color, young men of color, college access and equity and inequity, and gang associated individuals. His most recent projects focus on men of color, as well, um, or excuse me, men of color retention programs, as well as students' parents in the community college system. His scholarship appears in Boyhood Studies, Education in Urban Society, Teachers College Record, Urban Education, Urban Review, and other social science journals. He earned his PhD in education from UCLA and is a past recipient of the AERA Minority Dissertation Fellowship. So please welcome Dr. Adrian Huerta. Thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, definitely humbled and honored to be with, with y'all today and to share some of the work and specifically practices to think about different student populations in community colleges. Um, with that, let me share my screen so y'all can see this. Okay, can y'all see that? Yes? All right, awesome. Okay, so again, um, my name is Adrian Huerta. I'm an assistant professor of education at USC, the Polia Center. There's my uh, handle if, if for anyone that's Twitter active. So I'm gonna be talking to you about um, gang associated youth and former gang members, uh, student parents in community colleges and men of color retention programs. So I'm gonna give you like some quick facts, but then also some recommendations on things that work um, and things to think about as you do the work with these various populations. All right, so really quickly, sometimes people are like, well, you know, what's a gang? And uh, uh, because there is some confusion within California nationally and internationally on what constitutes a gang and what makes a gang member versus this or this. So the definition I've been working with is um, there's a group in Europe called Eurogang. And it's a collaboration between US and international scholars that have come up with this definition that looks at uh, youth groups that are a part of like street oriented that are involved in illegal or criminal activities. And it's uh, revolving around a group identity, a group shared identity for those activities. So with the work that I've been doing for almost the last 10 years with uh, gang involved youth, it's many educators ask why, why does this matter? Why is this a big problem? And one of the biggest things that I point at is that gang, only 50% of gang youth will graduate from high school. And that's a critical problem when we think about who are these young people and why aren't they going into higher education if we know that higher ed credentials are the most secure ways to, to get college degrees uh, or the most secure ways for social mobility. So what happens in K through 12 is we do a really good job of punishing and criminalizing youth and pushing them, pushing them out of the educational pipeline and most of the time that people join gangs is for validation, support, for a sense of community, for a sense of, um, you know, like connection. And it's really that piece that helps young people to feel safe and secure and connected when they feel so many disconnections or have fractured relationships in their home schools and communities. So focusing on gang involved young people is really important for us, specifically in California, because the latest research tells us that there's over 50,000 kids in California that have self-reported gang membership. So if we know national data tells us that only 50% of those kids will graduate from high school, 
we're talking about t- potentially 25,000 kids throughout California that won't graduate high school. So when we think about the college pipeline, if we're already lost this many people because they've either been incarcerated, they're not working, they're doing other things instead of going to higher ed, that's a big problem for us and the work that we do and the students that we serve. Um, so for one of my most recent projects, I interviewed gang involved young men um, in three continuation schools. Sometimes we call them behavioral schools, sometimes we call them alternative schools. And this work is really important because what I found was that these young people wanted to go to college. They're like, hey, I wanna become an architect. I wanna become a construction manager. I wanna become a chef. I wanna become a lawyer, probation officer. I wanna do all these things. One, for themselves to have income and stability, but two, because they know they didn't wanna be poor growing up. And what one of the challenges uh, challenges are and were is that school counselors in these schools often said, well, that kid gets in trouble a lot. So I'm not gonna share college information with him because he's bad. And so these counselors often withheld college information from these kids, which left them on their own to figure out, well, what do I do? And most of them talked about, you know, I don't wanna to go to the community college because I heard the for-profit is better. I heard this other school is a lot better and they're, they're more connected to the industries I wanna be in. So a lot of the students were talking about going to for-profit schools over community colleges because the recruiters came to their house and talked to them. The recruiters were really clear on how much they were gonna pay. They were really trusting. They were really able to broker strong relationships with these gang involved youth um, and their families. So how I'm building on that work. So I interviewed gang involved kids, but uh, most recently I've been interviewing former gang members. So I've interviewed close to 35, 40 former gang members who have gone on to earn AAs, BAs, MAs, and some doctorates. And what they're telling us and what they've told me and my research team is that K through 12 was not my place. They were called menaces. They were, uh, they were called criminals. They were called terrorists. They, and once you peel back like the actions in schools, we learned about so much pain, trauma, suffering that was happening throughout their adolescence. It's like, how can they trust an adult that isn't really willing to see their humanity? So that work is still evolving. We're still interviewing former gang members to understand like, how did you get to higher ed? Like, what was your thing? What was your motivation, your inspiration to get there because of so many fractured relationships in K through 12? So that work is still evolving, but the work that I have published, I'll give it a highlight here in a moment, but these kids, what I want y'all to take away from this is that these boys, these young people want to go to college, but their schools are often ignored. And from the field work that I've done in continuation schools, they weren't having college fairs. They weren't having college recruiters show up to their schools. Um, every once in a while, uh, I think one time I saw military recruiters, but these schools are often ignored. So when we think about recruitment and engaging these students, what does that look like? So for you all throughout the state, are you going to alternative or continuation schools to recruit students? And are you using language that is accessible? So if you're talking to a 16 or 17 year old about an articulation agreement, they're gonna look like look at you like you have two heads. They're gonna be like, what does that mean, right? The second biggest thing is like, in your recruitment and in your conversations with them, what is financial aid going to look like? Because these students are already worried about like, how am I going to pay for this if my mom only makes X amount of dollars a year? Or how am I going to pay for this if I have to help out my family? You know, they're telling me I need to start working and I got to move out when I'm 18 or 19. So what does that look like? And that leads into the next part of connections. How are these students going to be connected and who are they going to be connected to on your campus? What are the programs? What are, they, what are the services? So definitely like underground scholars and project rebounds are really great spaces. And I think there's still some variation across programs of what they look like, what is the funding, what is, you know, all these other elements to build trust with students, make them feel respected, but also make sure that we guide them into classes with professors that are gonna be empathetic, supportive, but also help push them through to transfer or to degree attainment. That connects to persistence through retention. What are the connections? What are the persistence? What are the things that we know from our practices and from the research that tells us if this student experiences X, they're gonna leave. So how do we be proactive with these things? Whether we're looking at academic probation, whether we're looking at the bundling of services and resources, 
how are what are the things that we can do to be proactive to ensure that students graduate or transfer so those are my recommendations specifically for this population of gang involved and former gang members and now i'm going to transition to my next one student parents who are they why should we care if you look at that biggest part of that graph they're in your institutions and if you see there's almost 4 million student parents across the us that are in enrolled in higher ed. So what can we do? How do we think about this population and why is it important? Well, we all know, and I think we can all agree that again, that two-year degree is critical for transferring for social mobility. But one of the challenges is often student parents experience time poverty. So they don't have time to be walking from this building to this building, to that building, to this other building to get a form or to get an answer. So how are you all gonna think about bundling services? How are you gonna, you know, for some students that are connected to care and other options, that's wonderful, but what about everyone else that isn't, right? Maybe they started a community college at 18, they had a bad experience, left, came back at 28, you know, are they gonna be ineligible for certain programs because of income, numbers of units of, uh, accomplished, their transcripts? How are we gonna revisit policies to support student parents? Because from the work that we've done interviewing student parents, they often had a really hard time figuring out who has the accurate information, how to get bundled up with services, and you know, pre-COVID, right? So, like, what are the what are the ecosystems of support that we can have for student parents to make sure they stay in our institution and graduate? Often, uh, with our specific focus of that project, we're asking student parents, well, who do you get information from about careers? And we ask them, do you go to the career center? And most of the students looked at us were like, well, what's that? Right? What do they do? Do they help us once we get our degree so then we can get a job? Like, what does that look like? So I guess I would push you all to think about what do career services look like for student parents who are maybe going part time, you know, they're working full time during the day and going to class at night. So what are those interactions and what are those interventions going to be for them to ensure that they stay in your institution? Another challenge that I would pose to students or to you all, not to the students, but what do child care centers look like post COVID, whatever that looks like, right? Are your child care centers only open from seven to five, Monday through Friday? And where does that leave the student parents on the weekends for your Saturday classes? So they're gonna have to beg a cousin and aunt and uncle, a parent to watch your kids on Saturdays so they can take classes. If that's the case, then how do you revisit your policies to get more hours or expand who is eligible for child care centers? Because most, from what I understand, most childcare centers are really restricted to like, you know, little tiny babies, so like four or five. But what happens with the kids that are seven or eight or up to 11? So if those kids aren't connected to after school programs, again, post COVID, how are they going to get support? How are they going to get enrichment? So, in thinking not just about the student parent, but an intergenerational model about focusing on the parent and also the child. So, what are support systems going to look like for them? If we know they're stressed, we know that they have various needs, whether that's food, housing, internet, whatever it is, how are we bundling these students so they can have resources, the support systems, and a name? So if they know, okay, at LBCC, I know Mike Munoz is an advocate for me, who else is gonna be an advocate for me at that institution, right? Who else is gonna have my back to make sure I get the answers that I need and I move forward with my degree instead of taking one class, stopping out one class, two classes, stopping out. So those are my recommendations there. Um, this is from a report that I will be able to share with you all that we published looking at specific recommendations that colleges, especially community colleges can do. Because one of the biggest challenges that we have as researchers is when we talk to community colleges, we're like, well, how many student parents do you have? And everyone just looks at each other. They're like, um, we think we have this many, right? So how can you do it through a quick fix and either through semester enrollment, through enrollment management of like, is there a box that a student parent or that all students can check that says, yes, I'm a student parent, I'm interested in more services. Boom, then you find out who are all your student parents, whether they're part-time, full-time, and then you can start bundling up all these services. And for this one, I will send out the link so you can see that report. It's really cool because I uh, co-authored it with Mike and Cecilia Riz Aguilar and some other people. So please check it out um, with that one. All right, uh, next one.
on our men of color programs. So next month I will finish uh, a three-year study looking at men of color programs. We interviewed about 175 student parent, uh, students, uh, uh, program staff, directors, VPs, like all, you know, from first time freshmen to people that are in charge of budgets. And we try to understand how these programs fit within the institutional structure, how they're connected to institutional goals, graduation, equity missions, all these things. And what we found was that there's so wide disparities in funding, support, um, staffing. Some programs had, you know, a counselor that was dedicated 25%. Other times, other programs had a full-time person with support staff and admin that were able to create all these things through not only mentoring, but sessions that focused on like gender masculinity, talking about pushing back on rape culture, you know, all these things to help men figure out how to navigate these spaces. And the, they're really effective when they're funded and they're an institutional priority. If you're saying, yeah, we have a men of color program, and it serves 15 students, that's great. But what about the other two or 3,000 men on your campus? Like, so as much as it's a program, it is one intervention, but how do we bundle? How do we get faculty? How do we get staff to understand and develop these spaces to be an institutional mission or priority? Um, especially as we look at national data that suggests that about 14% of men across the US have left higher ed because of COVID. So what does that look like at your institution? And I really push you all to think about your data and in, to interrogate your data on who has left and hopefully who will come back. So, um, all right. One of the biggest things that I push uh, colleges to think about is like, yeah, you're talking about men of color, but who are those men? So are we talking about Hmong men, Vietnamese men, Latino men, you know, black men, indigenous men, Pacific Islanders? Often it's like, well, men of color, but if it's not targeted to a specific, a specific population, then you're not gonna reach the men who need, it, who need the most support. Um, as I talked about funding in the five programs that we studied, one program, their, their funding was $1,500 to $2,000. Another program, their budget was close to a million dollars through donations, grants, you know, all these different ways to fund it. Staffing, like I mentioned, one program had like a quarter time person, Another program had like a, a team of people that were able to do the work. So you all can know and envision what a team versus someone that's 25% on how much support, infrastructure, mentoring, outreach, all those things can happen. Um, there's wide variations in programming, but I, I think that's where you need to look at your population and figure out what are their needs. Is it careers? Is it, uh, you know, like, um, emotional well-being and mentoring like that with focusing on like past trauma. Like what is your thing that is gonna like be critical for the men to one, to show up, but to continue to show up. Uh, the last point that I wanna stress is outcomes. How are you measuring success for your programs? And what does that look like? And how will you identify goals and successes for your men of color program? Having a program is great, but if you're not measuring success and involvement and outcomes, then how is it really working? So uh, let's see. And with that, here's just a couple things. If you wanna read more about this, um, please let me know. I can send out those things um, or share pages or you know websites or whatever. Um, thank you so much. And let me stop sharing. Okay, cool. I'm back. Thank you, Dr. Huerta. Um, I really appreciate you walking us through some of your research. Um, especially because I think it's really important. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of just reflect a little bit. When I first arrived at LBCC, um, and I was really trying to understand the student experience, and as I was talking to different students, I quickly kind of recognized that you know some of the the perspectives that are present in the room in our shared governance environments, the types of students that serve on our committees on campus that are involved in ASB and student leadership, didn't always capture the experiences of our gang affiliated youth or our student parents, or, you know, our young men of color. And so I thought it was really important for me to really kind of pause and engage those student um, populations in a way that was meaningful, where I could really listen and learn and understand their experience. And so I'm, I have a question for you. Um, what do you think we should be doing um, on our campuses 
to really bring forward those voices so that in an authentic way that really engages these students in a meaningful way. Because as I mentioned, so much of the planning for our college, the decision making, it happens through our governance structures, right? And so what does that look like? And what thoughts do you have on really bringing forward um, and being intentional about bringing forward that student experience um, for those populations that you are very dedicated to and that you research? Absolutely. That's a really good question. Because I think when we think about student voice, we often possibly look at student trustees as the voice, but what are the voice of students in different committees? And if they are welcomed, are they being compensated for their time, right? Because as I mentioned, you know, are, is this a work study student that is volunteering their time or are they being paid for their time because they have expertise, right? So it's like if they're on an equity committee or a transfer committee or the hundreds of committees we have in our community college, how are we intentionally welcoming, welcoming them and paying them for their time and their energy to be real with y'all. Because I think that's going to be one of the tensions about like, whether it's someone that was justice impacted or a student parent or a foster youth or whoever, like, let's bring them to the table. But we have to make sure that like, they know that whatever they share is really going to be heard out because they're going to really push the boundaries of like the way we think and we conduct our practices. Because some of it is them learning you know, academic affairs, how do they work? How do student affairs work? Because, you know, this is a whole new terrain, you know, even for us, for most of us, we're like, what is academic affairs? What does that mean? What is a provost? What is a chancellor? What, you know, like, you know, it's so much decoding, but I think once a student figures out that their voice really matters and if they're, you know, how do we ensure that the student it continues to be committed to our school because they feel connected and invested and that their voice is heard? I really appreciate what you just shared because there's a couple of things that really stood out for me. And, and it's interesting because um, I work with our ASB and they just passed a resolution this past semester at LBCC to begin to stipend student leaders to serve on committees because we recognize that um, you know everyone's there essentially in the room getting paid right to participate in our shared governance structures, um, but our students. And oftentimes there's a barrier for them to participate because that means you know, if I'm going to participate, they have to make a choice. Do I have to cut my hours back on my job or do I have to pay for someone to watch my child? Um, you know, all these different factors. Right. And so recognizing that it's really important if we are going to engage our students in our governance structures in an authentic way and meaningful way that um, we have to support them with that. And so I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that kind of reinforces at least the path we're taking. Um, the other part that really stood out for me is that the concept of what you talked about, like decoding the language and, this, and everything that's happening in our governance structures, because I think it's true oftentimes as someone that, you know, formerly, you know, came from student services, was a former CSSO, I oftentimes saw um, students oftentimes would be in our governance groups and our governance committees, but very rarely spoke up. And if it was, it was kind of this real trivial, okay, well, before we end this discussion, students, do you have anything to add? And then it was kind of like, well, no, it sounds great and sure. And it, it but it wasn't again, an authentic and engaging and meaningful way of living, a meaningful way, excuse me, of engaging with our students. So I think the idea of us taking the time to really walk students through these are, the, these are our structures and this is how um, you can engage within the structure so you feel empowered, right? So you have that confidence to interact with these provosts, these vice presidents, these deans in a way that you can essentially um, assert your voice so that that student perspective really comes forward. So thank you for that. Um, we have a couple questions that were put in the Q&A and so I wanna get to those. Um, Georgina, one of our colegas, Georgina um, raised a really good question. So what if you're a community college representative who really wants to enter alternative school spaces to, for recruitment, to support matriculation, but you're facing resistance from faculty and staff that don't necessarily believe the students are, let's say, college ready or you know, college bound? Um, what advice do you have for those that are working out there in the front lines directly with our students who are trying to break down those barriers? Oof. All right. There, there's two part of me. There's the, the cynic uh, faculty part of me that wants to tell other faculty members to like sit down because, you know, like really, they, it, it's really interesting to hear that question because often it's like you hear faculty that are committed to equity to, that will say college isn't for everyone, right? Those kids don't need college. But if you say that to their kid, it's like, whoa, whoa, no, my kid needs to go to college, but those kids don't. Right. So it's like, how can we really be committed to equity if we're already closing the doors to so many students? Right. And I think something that specifically with youth and um, 
alternative schools. Like these are schools that are for second chances, right? So then that way they can accumulate their credits, they can do all these things. So why are we gonna close the doors to them, right? Like that doesn't make sense. And I think something as I really, really admire Project Rebounds programs, and I think those are really awesome, but it's like, why aren't we investing similar interventions for kids that are gang, mem gang banging at 12 or 13, right? So it's like, what can we do, you know, to be, you know, more preventionalist within our work. You know, I think someone put a comment about dual enrollment, right? And it's often for the kids that are high achieving, that it hit the, all the right social norms or cultural norms of the school. But what about those kids in alternative schools are like, are they just straight up bored with K through 12? Is K through 12 not adhering to their needs? Their, whether it's learning differences or however you want to label it, how do we start pushing culture to like think about these kids in an asset-based way? And if for your enrollment management people, it's like, okay, well, what do we need to do to build a partnership with this school, right? So like, how do we get work-study students from our community colleges to go serve as peer mentors in an alternative school? Like, how can we start thinking about it differently instead of just saying, well, let, we're just going to go recruit at the school. Recruiting is one piece of it, but building trust with current college students that might have a shared experience, I think that's a game changer, right? So how do we do that, again, post-COVID? and trying to like make sure that students that are in these spaces that might be hating school, right? Because, you know, for various reasons, it might not just be one year, but it could be an accumul accumulation of years of being mistreated to all of a sudden have Ariana show up and be like, hey, look, I know you, like, you know, that you were me and I am you. So like, let me tell you how transformative this space was for me, right? So how do we do that? Because I think, you know, whether it's her or others in this group, it's going to be more authentic. So then they could start learning the language of like, oh, okay, that's what you can do in community college. Like, oh, okay. Because right now it's super broad, right? Students know, oh, go to college because that's what you do. But if you have other people that can broker and translate and hopefully empower students to be like, all right, okay, I know what to do before I even show up. Boom. There you go. Then that way you don't lose them after a year. I really appreciate what you just said. I think because um, oftentimes when we talk about, you know, building these partnerships with our feeder high schools, we don't think to include our alternative education sites. And I like there's two things that I heard that I think for those of us that are listening on the line, you know, what can we do right now? Right. Like what what's what can we actually put into practice relatively quickly? I love the recommendation about dual enrollment. Right. Many of us have all experienced a decline in enrollment um, as a result of the pandemic. And so we're always looking at ways to kind of rebuild um, through that enrollment management lens. And so is there an opportunity here to engage um, some of our students at our alternative sites through dual enrollment? Um, and I don't think it's just about dropping a course, right? Like you talked about, it's, it's that full kind of holistic way of working. So whether it's engaging them also with peer mentors, um, where we can offer some of our um, justice impacted and young men of color and other students um, to serve as kind of these peer navigators per se through work study to place them at these sites. Um, these educational sites, I think, would be very powerful in coupling that with dual enrollment opportunities. So I really like the example that you just provided. Um, I'm going to kind of expand because there's there's an, there's another question here, and I think it all kind of ties together and builds off of each other. So I'm gonna. This is coming from Martin. Um, the theme of student parents brings up and for him how institutions of higher education often strip away um, familia from Latinx students, uh, and so. Um, in terms of what is the you know educational experience of our students and so programs like Puente use familia to create community for students so how can we as a community college system leverage the concepts of familia and cultural community um, cultural community wealth as a college right strategy to uplift our comunidad um, and our students so that's a really good question and I'm going to plug in a paper that I just wrote that looks at community cultural wealth in Bordeaux and funds of knowledge and conversation with each other so that for people that are interested in expanding that work and understanding that work. I think on the practical side, like on thinking about the practice side, like post COVID, it's like, what is family night gonna look like in the future, right? Like how can y'all engage and bring students and their children to your campus? And even thinking about the redesign of libraries, like is there a space in the library where people can bring their kids? And if there is, is there developmentally appropriate toys for those kids? 
or in the counseling office or wherever on the campus to like signal like, yeah, if you have to bring your kid, they're not just going to, you know, be sitting there screaming because they're bored, but like, because there's crayons and color, you know, like little snacks and, you know, like, like toys that kids can play with. Right. So I think that's a, a, a shift in the practices and how we think about engaging in an authentic way, because most institutions, you know, are set up for the 18 to 24 year olds. So how do we think differently about our community colleges and welcoming student parents who could have one, two, three or more kids onto our campuses? And one of the things that we found was with our work was, you know, there were signs that says, don't bring your kids or we're canceling your appointment. Right. So it's like if your child care falls through, like it's ha- it has to me in multiple times when I needed it, like, am I supposed to, are we supposed to cancel like important meetings because child care fell through? Like, so how do we, you know, like if we want people to have empath- empathy on us, especially everything we've dealt with during COVID, like, how are we going to like raise a bar and put higher expectations for student parents who are in school trying to do it, trying to graduate, managing a thousand things at once? with often sometimes super low incomes. So it's like, how do we transform that stuff? So I think that's a push to college leadership to think about how do we bold, be bold and different with our practices to not just give lip, a lip service, but to actually start doing stuff on our campus post COVID. Awesome. Well, we're gonna start to wrap up Dr. Huerta, but I, I wanna throw one last question to you um, to, to leave us with before I turn it over to my colega, Dr. Cynthia Olivo. Um, to bring on our amazing panel. So, you know, as a researcher, you've had the opportunity to probably speak to thousands of different students who, you know, share all the identities we just talked about, right? Gang affiliated youth, student parents, um, men of color. So from all your different experiences, is there anything that stands out to you? Uh, uh, A particular interview or particular student experience that was shared with you that really just impacted you that you would want to leave us with to keep us at the forefront of our minds as we are moving forward and serving our students in a more just and equitable way. Oh man, okay. One that jumps out, that's a really great and tough question because I don't want to minimize the other stories, but one quote that really jumps out to me from a recent interview was a, a participant told me that a school leader when he was in K through 12 called him a menace to the learning environment right? Said like, you don't deserve to be in the school. You're a menace to the learning environment. We're kicking you out, right? And as I'm interviewing this person, he was completing his uh, qualifying exam for his PhD in social sciences and was a community college professor himself. And like, he was like, I just want to, like, he felt this immense pressure and pain. He's like, I want to be doing all this community level work, but I got to finish my dissertation. I got to do all these things. And I'm like, man, with time, like you should be really proud of yourself for what you've achieved. Like you draw, you got kicked out of school. He went back to community college, joined the military. He did all these things. And now like, he's like this close from getting a PhD and he's a community college professor. Like it was, you know, I think we both like, I was, you know, like, like I was at goosebumps. Like it was just radiating with pride for this man that I've never met before because like he's accomplished so much, overcame so much. And I think it's like, when we give people a chance like, you know, we can achieve so many, so many things, but it's like, why do we keep closing doors to people, you know, or why do we create like so many redundant policies that really hinder students and their abilities to succeed in our institutions? A policy is human made. So that means it could be corrected with, with foresight, you know, of, of our own ambition to, to make it different and better for our students. Thank you so much, Dr. Huerta. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to my hermana, Dr. Cynthia Olivo. Gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Huerta and Dr. Munoz. And you, you're, you're providing a perfect segue to our next speaker. And this is one of our former students at Pasadena City College and alumni, uh, Ariana Resendi. And Ariana is somebody who went through Pasadena City College without sharing her experience of being formerly incarcerated. And when she met with me, she she shared her story. And I asked her, who did you reveal this to? And she said, her sociology teacher. Uh, That's the person that she trusted at the college. And it just made me think, wow, if Ariana could navigate college on her own while holding Um, this part of her experience, her lived experience to herself. 
what would happen if we created programs and services so that our students would feel comfortable sharing, they feel validated, acknowledged, and supported and loved. And so I'm really proud to present to you Ariana, who's going to share about our core program at PCC. Ariana? Thank you so much, Dr. Olivo. And Dr. Olivo um, most likely remembers our interaction before we even had this conversation. Um, she actually helped me uh, go directly to English 1A instead of, uh, encountering these institutional barriers that would have prevented me from going directly to English 1A. And um, I really thank her for that. And I thank her for her partnership and dedication to our community. And, you know, really quick before I explain what the core program does, I just want to um, mentioned from the beginning that I'm going to be using the word FISI a lot, which stands for formerly incarcerated system impacted. And um, as mentioned by Dr. Olivo, this program didn't exist when I went to PCC. It left me feeling uh, kind of out of place. I had no one to relate to. Um, and, and before I go into the institutional support core provides, I really want to highlight and emphasize how important the community itself is to our FISI community and um, society in general, because our community has tons of gifts to share and to bring. Programs like CORE give us others to relate to, reminding us that we're not alone. What's more, we see the success of our FISI community members creating a cycle of reciprocity that does not stop giving. In other words, our community empowers each other as our students wanna give back, heal each other and create spaces of liberation through advocacy and power of storytelling and experiential knowledge that inspires others like themselves to be in spaces they otherwise would never see themselves in. As you will witness in the, in the student panel, um, CORE is a liberatory program at best. And it's not just because of the staff, but because of our amazing, resilient, and brilliant students who are incredibly talented and intelligent. So with that, let me go into a little bit about what CORE does. CORE provides services to formerly incarcerated and system impacted students enrolling at Pasadena City College. The primary goal of CORE is to develop a holistic approach, empowering students to succeed in higher education and beyond. The power focuses on building community on and off campus that will serve as social, emotional, and academic support for students. So many times, some of this is very unconventional to um, what the institutions normally provide. Um, sometimes students send a text around seven o'clock when people are not working anymore, saying that they just got kicked out of uh, where, where they live. Or sometimes they say that uh, the parole officer just came and violated them, they're going back. So this is some of the, the, the support that, uh, that is in, unconventional that we provide as well. Um, the, the eligibility to be in core is that you're currently enrolled at PCC. You're enrolled in at least three units. And sometimes students uh, drop out and still uh, uh, remain a part of our, our program. We still wanna offer them support. Should they um, wanna come back, we, we just wanna leave that door open. And uh, they identify as a student who has been affected by incarceration. So that could be somebody who has been in, somebody who is in, or it could be uh, somebody like my daughter who uh, came and visited me while I was in prison. She would be considered system impacted. Now, some of the services provided by CORE, some of the general services is assistance with college enrollment and services. So like open CCC, that is something that is overwhelming. When I paroled in 2013, I had no idea how to do any of this. Thankfully, I had a strong mother who helped me and guided me with this process. But open CCC could be very overwhelming, especially to a student sometimes who has done 20 years in prison, comes out and things are totally different. Um, guidance in applying for financial aid and scholarships, academic counseling, academic tutoring, student peer mentorship, transfer preparation, expungement workshops, access to community resources, assistance with job readiness. But more specifically, some of the, some of the hurdles that they encounter that we help with is selective ser service requirements uh, for aid. Uh, men that are between the ages of 18 and 26, uh, some of us don't know, but have to, um, have to apply for selective service. And if they didn't do that during that time, 
they will not be granted aid, of which I heard is changing this year. So we're happy about that. Um, out of state fees imposed um, sometimes happen as well. So students are considered out of state because they were in prison in another state. So we go through um, admissions and records to try to help them navigate that. We don't just say contact admissions and records, we contact them and CC them on there because a lot of the times when we just refer students to these institutional um, uh, to these institutional offices, they'll just say, you know what, forget it. And I know that I would have done the same thing had I not had help and guidance from my mom. So th that's another thing that we do. Um, we also just recently partnered up with Guided Pathways, um, the first year experience uh, program at PCC. So we help them uh, secure those requirements so that they can obtain priority registration. Um, we also uh, partner up with, uh, with teachers during the time that they're in classes uh, so that our students can, can succeed in those classes. Um, we offer court support letters for when they're going to go to court. We uh, come to PACT meetings and recruit possible new wonderful students at PACT meetings. PACT meetings are uh, informational meetings uh, for, for the state parole. Um, we also contact their probation and parole officers to let them know how wonderful our students are. Um, we also have uh, guidance with securing techno technology services such as hotspots and loaner laptops. Uh, we also refer to the Department of Rehabilitation who is an additional resource. Uh, this is for students who have uh, documented uh, different abilities. Um, we also provide telling your story workshops amongst many other workshops because many times our FISA community encounter very inappropriate questions such as what were you in for? So we, um, we, we provide these telling your story workshops so that they can adequately be prepared for these inappropriate questions and be able to say, excuse me, that's inappropriate. I'd rather not answer that. Um, we also created uh, positions uh, known as community engagement leaders to uh, some of them uh, right now are mentors for Youth at Promise at the Flintridge Center, a local community partner here in Pasadena. And um, we also uh, created this uh, community engagement leaders to help new enrollees to do all of the institutional stuff that I just mentioned at the beginning. And you know, though um, enrollment rates are down for colleges, Enrollment rates have gone through the roof for CORE through uh, word of mouth. And we are so proud to say that um, just this year, we graduated 18 students at CORE, um, 18 graduates and transfers. Some of them went to UC Berkeley, UCLA, Pepperdine, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State LA, the Cal State LA, which is where I graduated from, and many more. And in addition, we provide professional development workshops, internship opportunities to students who are interested in the FISA community, language guides, and guiding principles to help combat the stigma our community faces and bring awareness in other academic settings as well as other communities. This is the gist of the program. I'm sure there's a lot of things that I left out, but please feel free to contact myself or my colleague, Dr. Francoso, who is an amazing person. I wish he could have been here, but he has family stuff that he's doing. And um, we'd be happy to share any resources or any knowledge or um, just build community. And, and um, I just thank you so much for allowing me to be in this space. It's an honor and a privilege every time that I think where I'm at now to where I was before, it really is uh, so humbling. And um, now, you know, with a further, uh, without further ado, uh, our students from PCC, the future Dr. Juliana Salas and Dr. Ryan Mendoza will share their experiences. So um, Juliana, you can go ahead and share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. Good afternoon, my name is Juliana Salas. I'm a first year college student participating in the core program at PCC as a system impacted student. I'm a support system for my dad, my brothers, and my ex-spouse who have all been previously incarcerated. I joined the core program in March after my ex-spouse heard about this program through a friend that he worked with. I was not expecting this program to have such a huge impact on my life or my college career choices as I myself have not been previously incarcerated, but after joining this program, I quickly realized that it's a huge family. Everyone there is there to cheer you on and support you through your college experience. 
I am in my second semester here at PCC and I've noticed that a lot of staff are, as well as students here at PCC are unaware of the core program. I feel PCC would greatly benefit if they made this program aware to all their students who attended, much like many other programs that are offered through PCC. Some suggestions to make this program known would be adding a flyer to the PCC main website or even posting flyers around the school once we return. By doing that, you can encourage students to join CORE if they were previously incarcerated or even if they were system impacted, such as myself. Students need to know about programs like this. They need to know that they're not alone. Sorry, I get very emotional. Um, there's, there are so many great people that are here to support and encourage them. Sorry, this is a little personal on this part. Last semester was super tough for me. I lost two family members and I had a huge move take place. I was super discouraged, but I often found myself running to my core family. They were so encouraging. <laughs> And I have been blessed to hear some of the things that these wonderful people have been through, their successes and how they have made it. They make me, they made me want to keep pushing. They gave me a hunger to finish what I started. I know I am not alone because I have my great family through CORE. I know so many people can benefit from this program. We just have to spread the word, put it out there and let others know that they are not alone in their journey. CORE is here and they have and will make an impact on those students formerly, in, formerly incarcerated and system impacted. In closing, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak on the behalf of the CORE program and I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you, Juliana, and we're with you. You are not alone. You have a huge familia in Colegas and in CORE. We're so proud of you. Thank you for sharing. I also wanted to say how proud we are of Ariana. Ariana just graduated with her master's degree, and during this webinar, she was texting me saying how inspired she felt by listening to Dr. Hernandez and Dr. Huerta, and she wants to get a PhD at USC también. So I told her we're gonna help her make that happen. Thank you so much um, to Juliana. And next we have our student from PCC. Um, Ariana, if you could please introduce. Yes, absolutely. I have had the great pleasure of working with our next student, Ryan Mendoza. Um, I'm just so honored and I am so happy and blessed to be in both Juliana and Ryan's space. So go ahead, Dr. Mendoza, you're next. If you could please unmute yourself. We don't wanna miss any of the jewels you're yeah. gonna drop. <laughs> See, I'm still getting used to the technology. It slips my mind once in a while. Um, thank you very much, Ariana. Thank you everybody for having me here today and giving me a chance to be a voice for people who are in my position currently. Um, I am and do identify as a formerly incarcerated student and I am currently still incarcerated. I'm in a transitional living space in Los Angeles County. It's called the Male Community Reentry Program and it is designed for men who are coming out of prison who did very well in prison and it, it's a slow reintroduction to society. Um, I have done a total of 15 years incarcerated in California state prisons. Um, I was, I am a former gang member, uh, but about almost 10 years ago now, uh, I made the decision to formally walk away from all gangs and criminal activity and anything that comes along with criminal mentality and criminality. Um, my life has changed dr drastically since education has been brought into, into my past. Um, I want to describe for you guys today what differentiates education from being incarcerated to maybe that's what it's like out here. 
I want to tell you guys a little bit about the core and programs like this have done for me and my life and how it's impacted even the people that are very close to me, like my immediate family members, some of my friends. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how incarcerated students maybe differentiate from, from regular students, our perceptions and, you know, uh, the paradigms from which we operate with and how, they, how they're different and why education is so important for people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated and come from gang backgrounds. So, like I said, my name is Ryan Mendoza. I'm 36 years old. I have two children and I have done 15 years in, in prison. Um, I just recently got out 90 days ago, about three months ago, and I am here. Uh, education in the prison system is very, very minimal and limited. Not limited in, in the way that it's not there, because it's there and we have programs in prison that offer a free education. And now, and I'm telling you for somebody who just came out of there, more people, more men, and I'm sure women as well in their facilities are taking advantage of the educational system and the fact that it's being provided for us and, and given the opportunity to pursue it if you, if you want it. Now more than ever, 15 years ago when I first came in, it was unheard of. Nobody was in college. Nobody was seeking education. These opportunities were not provided to us. And now they are, and more people are going back to school if from all ages, I've seen men from 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year old men going back to getting their education now that have been in there for 40 years. My brother was one of them. He did 33 years and he got his education and now he's out with a, you know, his degree and his OSHA certification and doing all kinds of things, good things, being a productive member of society. And education in there is very random and it's hindered because of the environment and the economy that that goes on in prison, as you guys can imagine. Um, and so it's very, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. You can pursue it, but sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, I spent about four years in the last four years or four to three years in prison trying to get my education. But because of things like COVID, they completely shut down. There was no online options like there is right now currently, like I'm at PCC doing online. And there wasn't, there wasn't anything, there wasn't anything available for us. Or sometimes it would shut down for weeks at a time due to institutional procedures and, and whatnot. So it's very demotivating for a, lot of, for a lot of incarcerated students. However, there are still some that strive to get their education. And for all of you who are teachers, and I want you guys to know that there are many students that are coming out of prisons and that are currently in prison that are truly trying to reshape their minds and lives through education. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And there are many there that are actively seeking it. And so the desire is there, the motivation is there. And it only gets further cultivated by these wonderful teachers that come behind these walls and give their time because there's, there's a lot of teachers that don't wanna come behind those walls. They're afraid to come or whatever it is, the stigma that carries with prisons and prisoners and the institutions, and they don't wanna come. And when they do come, transformation happens. I've seen, I've seen guys who are on destructive paths in there. And the moment they step into a classroom and about six months later, they're a completely different person. All of a sudden they're coming to, they were, you know, coming to me, hey, Ryan, do you want to study, man? We're in the same class. Hey, we're in the same sign language class. Hey, man, you really got this down. Do you want to study? Absolutely. So being in school behind those walls, there's a lot of desire there. A lot of desire, which I'm sad to say is like I've interacted with some of my professors out here and they say, hey, we wish, we, man, we wish you would talk to some of our students, tell them to take advantage of these Zoom meetings with our professors. Hey, that's one of the most helpful things that professors do for their students is to be able to meet with them online and to be able to interact with them. And uh, the doctor touched on it the very first, uh, the very first thing in this meeting, he touched on it about the empathy and giving a connection. You know, quite often what I've noticed from a student's perspective is that it is not quite up to the information that's being passed from the teacher to student, but it's the love that convey, that is pervaded by the communication that really seeds it in the heart of the student and is that transformative factor that changed the hearts and minds and lives of students. And that's like, 
coming out and coming in and stepping into a very limited, going from a very limited economy and environment like prison and education system and stepping in and stepping out here and coming in and finding out that there's a program called CORE, Community Overcoming Recidivism Through Education, that was so that was so helpful because I was honestly like really worried. It's something that I told my family members. It's something that I told, you know, my church members that I was like, man, I'm so afraid about what people are going to think about the way that I look when they know that I was incarcerated for all these years. You know, what are they going to say? Are they going to give me a fair shot? And it was something that I was really worried about. But when I was well welcomed with open arms and I was shown all of these resources and everything that was that was available to us. It was extremely helpful, and the teachers have been have been very helpful at PCC, and I'm really glad to be a part of this program, and I'm very thankful and grateful because I'm, I'm so motivated, so much more motivated and determined than I've even been in the past eight years, even more so now because uh, I've just been filled with so much like love and welcoming and connection. And from teachers that I haven't even met and they and like they were like wow I didn't even know this program existed but this is great can you tell me more about it and I was absolutely and so it is very transformative and it's a very and it's a determining factor when you do make and, and like yeah you don't have to be best friends with your students but when a student knows that you care about anything man that's what stays in the heart and mind and lives of, of children of adults of anybody really it's that connection that we make with people and it's a wonderful thing. And especially coming from somebody like this, like how we're different, you know, uh, a lot of us come with many, many issues that stem from core factors that when we were children and carried into our adult lives and people have never discovered those things and have freshly discovered it now. And those things are, are, are all contributing factors. And I just wanna um, say that education has become the most important thing in my life today. And I know that it's the springboard into my reinculcation into society and becoming a productive member and to be able to give back after taking so much. And I just wanna thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this and to be a voice and to maybe help change some, uh, some perceptions of the stigmas that come with people that are in my position. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, uh, Juliana, and thank you, Ariana. You've inspired us today, thank you. And I'm really, really proud to introduce our next colega, Dr. Guadalupe Corona, who will introduce our next uh, panelists. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ariana, uh, Ryan, and Juliana. Thank you for sharing your journey. I am so blessed and honored to represent Southwestern Community College. We have a history of supporting our restorative justice impact to students. I want to honor this space by bringing in Ms. Patrice Malkovich, who's been a visionary ahead of her time at Southwestern and created an amazing restorative justice program, along with Rachel Funches, who works directly with our students. We actually have a program that uh, works with currently incarcerated students, which offers uh, credit based learning uh, with three actually associate degrees and a American Sign Language um, certificate program. So we've been extremely successful and building a bridge of educational opportunity for justice impact to students in the San Diego community. Uh, we have amazing faculty that actually go on site and teach. We have counselors that go on site and also financial aid counselors that work with our students to support their success at Southwestern College. We are one of three colleges that um, initiated the uh, second chance Pell Grant program for students who were currently incarcerated and we call them Southwestern students because they are students and we take pride in serving them. And our program has multiplied in ways we never ever dreamed of, which is a great way to say that our program is, is building bridges for education. Um, we also have information on our website. So if you look up Southwestern Community College and under our student equity page, uh, we have a link that has some of our uh, resources that we offer our students, including a handbook that uh, wonderful uh, Raquel put together to help our students and guide them through their pathway. Um, also student equity provides a lot of support to buy books for classrooms or uh, provides uh, funding to make sure that our students are supported in this process. One of the biggest joys that I have is my why is working directly with students. And we have two students that I'm so honored to introduce to you today. Uh, we have um, our former uh, student who just graduated, 
uh, last fall, and I'm so honored to have had an opportunity to work with Mr. Cristian Sanchez. Uh, he's our former ASO president and uh, Phi Theta Kappa president, um, also Mecha vice chair, and all those capacities. I've been so blessed to uh, have a relationship and work with uh, Mr. Sanchez. And um, then after Mr. Sanchez, I'll have him introduce Ruben Radillo, who is our newest student on campus, and then they can tell their story about mentorship, which I heard um, Dr. Huerta talk about the power of mentorship. Um, and Christian can talk about Alpha Phi, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, his um, student club and partnering with our uh, Restorative Justice Initiative and how a mentorship program helps our students succeed. So with all, uh, all respect, Mr. Sanchez, um, take it away. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, as Dr. Corona said, my name is Christian Sanchez. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Southwestern College and uh, going to be transferring to Stanford University uh, this coming fall um, to pursue a bachelor's degree in English. And um, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for allowing us to share this space with you all and giving us the opportunity to, to speak our truths and to speak um, on our journeys. And um, for myself, um, I, I'm a, I'm a non-traditional student. I have five children. So coming back to school was uh, one of the most difficult decisions that I had to make. Um, being, being in that situation, um, I was coming from a life of, of self-destruction and, um, and not necessarily taking the, the necessary steps to correct that in my life. And so um, just with that being said, I would like to say that I'm 100% sober now and I feel good about myself and I feel good about the choices that I've made. And um, I would like to jump into the topic that Dr. Oran was talking about was our mentorship program and being the outgoing president for Phi Theta Kappa Alpha Pi Epsilon, we created a mentorship program that partnered with the restorative justice program at Southwestern College with Patrice Malkovich and Raquel Funches. And going into that, um, going into that situation, me being you know, coming from the background that I come from, uh, I'm not necessarily um, formally incarcerated, but um, I do know plenty of individuals who have gone down that road. And so I do have some experience with, with, um, with those folks. And so I was given um, an opportunity to have a mentor, a mentee uh, who is Ruben. And um, I, I'll let him tell his story, but my, my personal experience with that was, I didn't know what to expect coming into it because um, as, as I stated before, I do, I do have a very, very close friend who is actually doing 22 years of life for a crime that he didn't necessarily commit, but he was present when the act was committed. And so, um, gave him the largest and so I've had communications with him through written letter and you know some of the things he would tell me and I've even visited him in um when he was at San Bernardino County and you know just just going through that entire experience was you know it was my it was eye-opening because I knew that that would have been myself had I not made little choices that would have impacted my life so much so to the point that I would probably be right alongside with him in, in behind those walls. And so I, I feel grateful that I've never been to prison, that I've never been in trouble with the law. So that's one thing that I, that I feel blessed with. But, you know, when I was partnered with Ruben, I just was a little hesitant because I was like, you know, I don't want to, you know, come off too aggressive. I don't want to, you know, make him feel that I'm trying to crowd his space because I'm the type of individual that I like to help people because, um, I've never, I've never been helped myself throughout my life in terms of education or, or even in, in life in general. I was always downplayed. I was always told that I was not enough or I'll never be enough and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I didn't want to come off too strong. And um, I just, I just, the first day that I met Ruben, he was like, yeah, man, come down to my house and, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get our thing started and, and, and whatever. So I was like, okay, so I go to Ruben's house and I'm just thinking I'm walking up to his driveway and I see him walking out and I'm like, okay, how do I, you know, like, you know, like, I don't want to have, cause I guess I have this face too. They say that I, I have like a, um, a very serious look to my face, I guess. And, and it's not intentional. I just, I guess, I guess it's just how it is, but um, I just didn't know really what to expect. I guess I could just to sum it all up. And the minute Ruben started speaking, I was like, wow, man, this dude, he's, he's cool, man. Like he's, he's, 
he's a great guy. And, and so we started getting into some of the things that he needed help with. And, and for me, going through that process with Ruben, I thought, man, how is it like, how is it that I take these things for granted? Like for me, it's like, it's a flip of a switch. I can just go and take my light switch and flip it on. But for Ruben, it's like, okay, I need to write it down. I need to do this. I need to do that. So it was much more, it was much more of a personal experience where I was like, okay, Ruben, we have to do it this step and this step, and this is the steps we need to take to do that. And through that entire process, I learned that in many ways, although that some students have not been some students may not be incarcerated, but they do face similar struggles. And I think Ruben can can say the same that although he's been incarcerated, he's faced some of the same struggles that, you know, students who live on the outside. And he said many times to me, he's like, man, he's like, I didn't know you guys go through this. I'm like, yeah, man, like we have problems too, man. We go through things too, man. And he's like, man, he was like, I never thought things like that happened. And I was like, yeah, man. I was like, you know, but it's 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 about it's about learning how to take that experience and saying, okay, what can I do better next time? And so for me, this experience that I had with Ruben was, was life-changing and it's even changed my relationship that I have with my, with my, with my friend that's, that's, that's in, uh, that's currently incarcerated right now. And, um, and as I have other friends who are going in doing a year or two years, you know, little, little, little um, stints like that, it, it, it allows me to understand and empathize with their situations and to also help me help them because as I said I'm just a person who likes to help and when I'm invested in something and 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 I feel that I have purpose or I have worth in a specific space then I, I'm all in and and so um yeah I just thought that this was one of the greatest experiences that I had with with um our program that we created um with restorative in partnership with restorative justice and so I just want to thank you again um thank you doctora um thank you everybody at uh, and um I appreciate the time. Thank you. Would like to invite Ruben? Hello, everyone. My name is Ruben Radil. And there's um, um, Christian confessed. Yeah, when, when I first seen him, I said, oh, here we go again. This guy, I think he's going to put a knife in my hand and make me do something. He was so intimidating, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but, you know, um, yeah, me, me and... Uh, me and me and uh, uh, Christian, man, we we've um, we bonded really good, and um, and uh, you know I love the guy. You know he, he you know, um, uh, you know we feed off of each other. You know, um, and uh, some sometimes um, I don't know. It's just, it's just like it, it goes back and forth. But yeah, I, I did twenty five years. I've been out of uh, about um, to, uh, I did twenty five, but I did. 31 altogether you know I was a what they call a three-time loser but as uh, Professor Paul Hernandez that says that that now I'm a student at promise not a student at risk you know um, and uh, uh, yeah we, we I started getting into I, you know I, I, I consider myself a, a, a goner you know I, I, um, I expected to die in prison uh, those uh, um, um, individual by the name of Mr. Hicks, you know, was coming by and asking people to, to, if they wanted to join college and I didn't want to. And he, um, he says, come on, give it a try, you know? And, and I, 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 I signed up for uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, program that they have. Um, and, and I, I, I excelled, you know, um, I was listening to all the, um, the, um, the, the testimonies that everyone was giving and I was fortunate um, to have come out and had some real good professors, um, Professor Banner, uh, Mr., uh, Professor Bass and Professor Law. They, they were very uh, compassionate and very empathetic to my situation. Um, and as um, Adriana was saying, of all the trouble that people go through, uh, uh, people who, who um, get released, um, is, is exactly what she said, you know, it, everything is just different, you know, the last thing I was out here, um, the, the latest technology when I was out here was the beeper, and mm -hmm. so when I come and, and, and I see, you know, these iPhones, and, and so when the college gave me a, a Chromebook to do my homework, um, you know, I, I struggled, I mean, I struggled, and I struggled, and I struggled, you know, uh, but 
I, I would you know be relating this and I would ask for help, you know. And if it wasn't for um, individuals like Raquel Funches and, and Christian, uh, who you know helped me with the process of getting financial aid and and getting into classrooms, um, you know, I, I would have gave up a long time ago. I was like, man, you know what? Um, I, I don't need the financial aid. Let's just try to do it some other way. And but um, you know, but because of the programs that they have put in place for individual who um, who who all their lives was, um, you know, told uh, when to go eat, when to go shower, what time uh, to go to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, um, that decision-making part of your brain <clears throat> kind of lays dormant and, 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 and it takes time to activate. <clears throat> so, um, so that's where I'm at, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pushing through um, and and what advice would I give the community um, who who sat here today to listen to us is is exactly what um, I, I believe what the professor Paul um, Hernandez who I think it was who, who said that you know if, if, we, if we interact if we um, uh, you know get acquainted really uh, really well with the students I, I think that what made a difference for me I think um, because I was shown that I was a person and not a number and not a, a student number. Um, I was I was able to um, to keep on pushing forward, you know. And I want to say congratulations to Ryan. You know that 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 um it takes a lot of courage to um to to um to to make a, a turnaround like that. Um, I still to this day get phone calls from uh, the level four guys inside the prison. How they got my number, I don't know, but. You know, they, they say, hey, man, well, how, how did you get out, man? You know, um, you know, um, I thought you were supposed to die in here. You know, you, you, you were a worse person than I am, you know, and I already got, you know, some murders in here, you know. And um, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's the programs that 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 are put in place that gives us hope to individuals who um, who um, who give us um that empathy, compassion, and that connection to to, uh, to being a person that that uh, that helps us good push forward. So I just also want to say say thank you to Julia because she um, she showed a lot of empathy and a lot of um, holding space for individuals like us. So if you guys have any questions, thank you so just, uh, much. Ask thank them. You so I'll be glad to. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And um, we, we thank the students for sharing with us today. And Michelle is going to lead a Q&A session with all of the panelists. So we appreciate the Q&As that you've posted. And we invite more while Michelle is posting some, posing some questions to the panel. All right. Thank you again to all of our panelists, especially our student panel. Um, one of the questions that was posed is, how can faculty or classified professionals set up a classroom or an office or an environment to show support? And Juliana, you did type an answer. Did you want to first speak to this and, and share your share your wisdom? Um, yeah, sorry, my phone was like not letting me unmute. <laughs> um, so I feel like um, it's more like uh, bringing it to the students' attention that there is this program here for them. Um, I believe it's different in different colleges. Like, for example, PCC has the core program and other colleges have the Rising Scholars program. It's also similar. Um, but uh, I think the main the main thing is to bring it to their attention um, that there's a program that that is offered at this college that if anybody fits into that category that they may they may want to check it out and see um, if if they would like to be in that program. So um, like mainly just I just feel like it's um, bringing it to the students' attention in the classroom so that they know that they're not alone and there's there's programs out there that are ready to support them and cheer them on during their college journey. Thank you, Juliana. 
Uh, Joe Lewis did share with us, you know, some of the examples in our community colleges, the programs that exist out there are Rising Scholars Network um, that helps provide support for formerly incarcerated students, programs such as CORE at PCC, Rise Scholars at Rio Hondo, Rising Scholars at Mount Sac. So um, being knowledgeable about what programs are available at your own campus and also what are some other programs available maybe outside or at other campuses that you can connect students to. Thank you. So another question for our student panelists. Um, do you think that education will stop you from being criminalized? And the second part to that question is what are your thoughts on community college on the community college system as a continuation of the school to prison pipeline? And that's open for any of you to answer. Yeah, hi, I'd like to answer that. Um, you know, I, I responded to that question and I absolutely, I know that I absolutely believe that it does. It stops people from being criminalized. You know, if, um, if they go to school for the right reasons and they are motivated, if they are intrinsically motivated, which most people that go to school and make the volitional choice to do that are, um, and when they obtain that education, you know, what you're doing is you're instilling a new paradigm into the person's mind from which to operate. And the person doesn't use those old neurological pathways to, sh to shuffle right down to their old criminality. They don't do that anymore because they see a much better way. And they start experiencing the rewards from education, like in the same way I have. You know, like when I said that education has touched not only my life, but the people's lives around me, it's because it's cultivated not only new, but it's enriched the relationships that I do have with my family members, with my fiance, with my children, with old friends that I haven't seen for the last 15 years because I've been incarcerated. Friends that, you know, they, they've never been in a pair of handcuffs in their entire life. They've never been, they're, I'm the only person they know who has committed a crime. You know, these are people who are multi-million dollar um, business owners and are now coming back and like saying, hey, Ryan, Oh my, I can't believe what, you, what you're doing and where you're at now in life. We want you to do this for us. We want you to run this part of our company. And I'm like, wait, hold on, slow down. I don't even know what you do yet. I mean, you know, they see the change and it's, that's because of education. And education has given me that new paradigm from which I operate. My whole entire system is different. My system of thinking, my belief system is different. It's now not corrupted by these false ideals and these warped belief systems that were instilled in me by old gangs, you know? where everything was flipped upside down. Bad was good and good was bad. You know, that's, that's what was instilled as you and inculcated you as a young child coming into these gangs. It was all flipped around. And now education writes that wrong. You know, you start realizing the benefits of it. So I absolutely do, do believe that it, it, it does that. Thank you, Ryan, that's really powerful. Um, so not only did it influence you academically and, and, and your education, but holistically in your relationships with people and now your future career endeavors, right? So that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, another question. So again, thank you to the, this is um, offering thank you to the student panelists for your courage and sharing your story. Um, our audience is awed and inspired by the brilliance and the courage that you all have shared. So given the environment that you uh, were in, what could have made a difference for you to keep away from the choices that led you to be incarcerated? Is there anything pre preventative or proactive that you think someone or something could have connected with you to prevent that? Can I jump in? Yeah, definitely go for it. I, I think this is where we start talking about like structural racism and talking about like how some communities are intentionally underfunded and you know there's so many larger forces than to put on the individual students that I think like so it's a good question it's a good hearted question but I think we need to take a step back and look at you know we know in our communities what schools are funded and what schools are underfunded we know what counselors guide students of color and low-income kids of color to AP and honor classes and take away those opportunities right so there's all these structural things that we need to think about too and versus an individual choice right so like there's all there there's larger systems at play that shape how even choice is conceived or perceived and actualized so I think like 
I, so I think that's an important qualifier. So uh, definitely I'll step back for, for y'all to jump in and throw in other pieces, but I think we can't take away, we, we have to think about the system level things that are happening that we know that it's not just, you know, Ruben saying, you know, today I'm going to go do this, right? right. It, was a, it was a culmination of life events and situations and, you know, factors that, you know, are beyond even our awareness that it's happening to us, right? So, but yeah, sorry. Well, I just no, had no, to throw no. that in there. Absolutely. No, that's important, right? Because it's not, uh, it's not the responsibility of the students to solve this problem. So as an institution, how do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we hold the institution accountable for making those changes first to be aware, but then also to be concrete in our steps to making those changes? If I may add um, one more uh, specific instant in my own life, um, something that would really help prevent the prison, um, the school to prison pipeline is just don't call kids on children. I mean, don't call cops on children. So the first case that I ever caught was um, I was ditching school and they called the cops on me. And so I went on house arrest, violated house arrest, went back. Then I turned 18 and went to the county jail. So just don't call the cops on children. And that would help a lot and prevent us from being pushed out of school and into prison. And instead, um, you know, uh, treat us with love and, and treat us, you know, with, with patience so that we can see our own brilliance and that that can be redirected uh, toward, towards higher education. And let us know that we could be in higher education. Let us know that we can be in these spaces. And um, one last thing that I would suggest is, um, uh, formerly incarcerated and system impacted students, push yourselves to be in spaces that you normally would not be in. Push yourself to be there because that is what's going to change the narrative of what it means to be Faizai. So, Thank you, so, Ariana. So my, my little two cents on, on that is that um, the policies that are, are made uh, when uh, students in, in, in you know, junior high or high school um, you know, uh, go against the rules and, and they have to see a dean or a police officer instead of, you know, taking counseling, that that just, that minimizes their chances of success because um, um, because they're all auto automatically, they're, they're already uh, in contact with, with, uh, with the uh, police department and, and uh, that's how it starts, you know, you, you know, as a, a, a young child you, you just start like rebelling after that you know so policies thank you Ruben any other thoughts on that question Dr. Huerta don't hold back <laughs> thank you no 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 you're right you know I I there is so many things I think we can do as, as community college leaders. And, you know, the earlier suggestion I brought up about even building relationships with alternative schools or with, you know, like juvenile justice schools or youth camps, like, what does that look like? Right. Like if we're really talking about like college access and equity, like what are we going to do differently, you know, post pandemic in our practices. Right. And who, and how are we going to do it differently and how, who's going to fund it? Right, because your funding priorities are dictated, you know, whether it's equity, like how are you gonna put money into those equity initiatives to make it sustainable, right? So are we gonna go soft money? Are we gonna make it a line item within our budgets to say this is a priority because we wanna lessen the school to prison pipeline or the prison to college pipeline or like whatever configuration we want. I think that's something that we have to take a responsibility for as leaders, as people that control budgets about how and what is gonna be our commitment to equity for justice impacted populations, whether in K through 12 or higher ed. So I think we need to sit back and be like, what do we wanna do? What can we do within our space and community, right? Because if you are at LACC, the number of nonprofits in your community is gonna be very different than just say Fresno or Bakersfield or you know, like how, what's in your ecosystem of control or, or community on what you can do. And I think like we mentioned earlier, like how creative do we wanna be if we're really committed to these issues? And, you know, on the local level, but on the policy level too, like are we gonna to talk to the board of supervisors in our community and say, we need to fix this, we need to change this and give us money, right? So in LA County, we're doing a lot of diversion work 
but like is how is a community college involved in those a uh, community college system involved in diversion conversations and i you know i don't know but like there's a lot of money on that table so how's a community where is a community college going to be as a stakeholder to be like we serve these populations give us money to do x y and z and then how are you going to evaluate it how are you going to assess it to figure out this is the impact that we're having on people Right. Thank, Thank you, you. All so much. We really appreciate your insight. There's a few more questions in the Q&A. I, I, we really appreciate everyone going in and offering answers. So if we can get to those and then let's bring our PowerPoint back up, please. Um, at Colegas, we want to thank our, our artists who allow us to feature their artwork. And next slide. Uh, this, this week, um, we featured, or this month rather, we featured the artwork of, uh, next slide, of Cali Arte. And uh, we feature their art and we ask that you provide support for them. Um, here is their website as well as uh, their Instagram handle. You can go ahead and um, purchase some of their art and just make sure that our artists are continuing to be supported. Next slide. We also ask that you join us for our next webinar. We thank our sponsors as well, um, Southwestern College, Evergreen Valley College, the Berkeley City College, Pasadena City College, the Los Angeles Community College District, the Chancellor's Office, and as a reminder, Colegas is an affiliate of the National Community College Hispanic Council. Next slide. Please join us in August. We are featuring our students who have recently finished their doctorates. They're gonna present some of their dissertation findings. And then we have also been contacted and asked, how do we publish our research? So we're going to be joined by the Journal of Applied Research in Community Colleges, our colegas there, as well as JLE, Journal of Latinos in Education, I am somebody who reads um, the manuscripts that are submitted there. So we're gonna discuss how to get published. We're also gonna celebrate all of our colegas pursuing all levels of higher education and have a little bit of poetry and spoken word. And then in September, we are featuring our chancellors, Chancellor Rodriguez, Martinez, Cortez, and Rodriguez. We're gonna have a, a drum circulo from Southwestern Community College and Dr. Eric Felix and the Chalice crew will be providing us some research and we'll close with a student panel. We look forward to seeing you the first Thursday of the month in August and September. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and to all of our panelists, Dr. Paul Hernandez, Dr. Adrian Fuerta, Ariana, all of our students, Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the Chancellor's Office staff for helping us today. We really appreciate you.